Pleased to welcome all participants in this session, speakers or attendees, whether on the EMC platform or on Facebook Live. And I wish to thank the EMC team for organizing this new European Forum in Music in such an efficient and professional way. Congratulations to all of you. My name is Benoit Machuel, and I am the General Secretary of, of FIM, the International Federation of Musicians, and a former professional musician. My organization is the NGO representing music performers and the trade unions worldwide. FIM is, of course, a member of the International Music Council and the European Music Council. After about 18 months of an unprecedented pandemic, Europe is beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. However, the music sector has been hit so hard that it is unlikely to recover fully once live music venues reopen. With a few exceptions, most music performers in Europe work as freelance, whether employed or self-employed. As trade union, as trade unions, we were already familiar with the precariousness that confront freelance musicians. The music gig concept is unfortunately used as a blueprint for an increasing number of jobs and professions. During the COVID-19 crisis, this precariousness suddenly became visible to the general public. A huge number of musicians have been facing a considerable drop of income with no significant support from the, from the governments. Sadly, many of them had no choice but to leave their profession for good. As the topic of this session is working conditions of musical artists, we will try to describe what these conditions are, why they need to be improved, <coughs> and how we can achieve this objective. For this panel discussion, we have an ideal balance of experts who will address the matter from a national, a European, and an international perspective. We will also learn about the respective roles of trade unions, the European institutions, and UNESCO in shaping a brighter future for musical artists. I suppose you had the opportunity to go to the speakers section of the, this platform. So you probably already know a little bit of Gary Neal, Sus Niengard, and Jean-Francois Guillardot. Gary Neal is an expert in cultural policy. He's also an author. He's, he's been working for 45 years in arts and cultural policy. We met about 15 years ago uh, the framework of uh, regional activities in Asia and other regions of the world. He's been involved very much in uh, cultural diversity with the Cultural Diversity uh, Coalition, the adoption of the UNESCO Convention in 2005. And he has published also a book on Canadian culture in the globalized world. Sus is the chairman of the Danish Musician Union. She's been working as a professional musician for many years and she was elected chairman of the Danish Musicians Union in 2020. Jean-Francois Guillardot is a policy officer at the European Commission Directorate uh, for competition. You will realize that is uh, very knowledgeable in competition matters, yeah. but is also very knowledgeable about a very interesting initiative that was launched by the Commission about a year ago, and which is uh, currently currently being developed with the contribution of the civil society. We've been contributing to a consultation lately, and I think uh, the Danish Union contributed as well. So I will now leave the floor to Gary Neal, uh, who will start with a uh, presentation uh, where you will, I suppose, learn a little bit about uh, the UNESCO recommendation of 1980. Thank you. The floor is yours, Gary. Thank you very much, Benoit. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank the European Music Council for inviting me. It's a very distinguished panel, and I look forward to our discussion. Um, as Benoit mentioned, <clears throat> I have been working for more than 45 years in cultural policy, and much of that work has been around improving the working conditions of artists. I used to be the executive director of the Canadian um, uh, Actors Federation. 
uh, and I have done significant amount of work on these issues around the world. So the roots of the status of the artist discussion go back to the 1980 UNESCO recommendation concerning the status of the artist. And even though it's now a 40 year old document, it actually has survived very well. It has, it has been very adaptable to the changes in technology and so on. And some of the core principles of the 1980 recommendation remain hugely relevant today because it calls on member states to recognize the important role that's played by artists in every society. And the keynote speaker this morning spoke uh, very eloquently about that to encourage creative expression by supporting artists and to introduce measures and programs which address the atypical work pattern that most artists in the world uh, uh, work. Uh, I note that uh, FIM and FIA both were very active and very critical to the development of the recommendation. And the, of course, the recommendations are further supported by the 2005 UNESCO Convention because it also recognizes the central role that artists play. And so status of the artist is really about policies, laws, programs, measures that directly improve the economic, social, and political status of professional artists. Uh, I, I'm actually, uh, I have done uh, three uh, global uh, surveys for UNESCO on the state of implementation of the UNESCO recommendations. And the last one was done a couple of years ago. And in fact, uh, the past decade has brought some legislative progress. Um, and on the legislative front, the best practice, of course, uh, which is increasingly common in many parts of the world, is to have a legal framework to deal with professional artist issues. Uh, we have about 20 plus countries that have omnibus status of the artist laws. And it's a general piece of legislation that uh, provides uh, impetus for specific measures to support artists. Uh, we can also have, we also see legislation addressing one or more specific concerns, such as taxation, social benefits, or the rights of labor. And a distinct or and or a distinct section of a national cultural policy. And as I noted, more than 20 countries have specific legislation now. Others have uh, legislation in very targeted areas that address professional artists. And quite a number recognize the central role of artists in their national cultural policies. In the area of social benefits. Uh, the last survey revealed that uh, there were improvements in providing social benefits to artists, and that was perhaps the high point in the recent assessment. We've seen progress reported throughout Latin America, very important initiatives in West Africa, in the Scandinavian country, and in almost every other region of the world. There's different ways that social benefits can be provided, of course. We can have state-run parallel programs. We can have special public measures that, again, are very targeted to specific issues. Or artist associations themselves have sometimes taken the initiative in developing parallel programs to provide the social benefits. But the very best practice, of course, especially with the rise of the gig economy, is to provide benefits in existing public programs that are adjusted to the reality of the, artist, uh, the artistic career. Um, actually, I, I have uh, skipped over a slide. Uh, it's all right. I think it may come up in the, in the conversation that on the legislative front, uh, probably the best example of omnibus legislation is in Morocco, uh, which is a very strong uh, status of the artist law, and it covers all of the bases. It covers working conditions of artists. It covers artistic uh, management and establishes uh, fee, uh, uh, it regulates fees and conditions. It requires contracts of all performers. It deals with the particular circumstances of 
of uh, children in the arts and cultural industry. Uh, it provides labor rights. Uh, but I note in on that slide that's now <laughs> missing is that it, it, even when you have omnibus legislation that's very strong, like the like that in Morocco, we still need practical measures because artists do we do find that artistic income uh, on in general is twenty to thirty percent lower on a global scale than other workers. So there are some other key issues that I hope we have a little bit of time to talk about. Uh, one is transnational mobility. Uh, certainly in the pandemic, we've, we've witnessed the closure of borders, but even before the pandemic, beginning in about 2001, uh, we began to witness uh, constraints, border constraints that have made it far, far more difficult for artists to travel and to work in other countries. And while there are a number of initiatives in, on a South to South basis, the most critical need is access to the countries of the global North. And that's both for artists from the South, but increasingly it's also for artists from the global North to have access to each other. Uh, another issue that's very important is few states protect freedom of artistic expression or creation. Almost every state in the world has freedom of expression as either a constitutional principle or a fundamental human right, uh, acknowledging, the, uh, uh, acknowledging the, the various UNESCO declarations, but very few have freedom of artistic expression or creation, and that's critical for artists who are outside of the mainstream. Uh, in, the current in, in the current climate, we acknowledge that we need changes, fundamental changes, in, in some case, to bring gender equality. Uh, 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 data indicates very clearly that there are fewer women who work in the music business than there are men. And that imbalance is very noticeable when you compare it to other cultural sectors. <clears throat> and finally, there is a discussion that's commenced globally about the need to reinvigorate what is now a 40-year-old recommendation. And while I say it has adapted uh, very well, I agree that I think it's time that artists associations, the international NGOs representing artists, should be lobbying to have UNESCO have another look at the 1980 recommendation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. I think it's a very good start for this conversation. Um, and there are aspects of the of the recommendation that link directly to uh, to the following interventions from Suess and and uh, Jean Francois. But I would like to recall everyone that this recommendation was adopted unanimously by the member states of UNESCO. I think it's very interesting, and it also refers to a number of points that I think are good references for uh, for uh, our conversation this afternoon. For instance. Uh, there is a clear reference to the right to establish trade unions and be part of these trade unions. There is a clear reference to the ILO conventions. There is also a clear reference to hours of work, weekly rest, paid leave, and also the protection of health and safety. And at the time the recommendation was adopted, there were already quite a lot of freelance, uh, freelance musicians and other artists. So it's obviously the recommendation covers all kinds of uh, all kinds of work, uh, all the ways artists may work, including as freelancers. So I think this unanimity among member states to provide a satisfactory protection to artists, uh, whichever relation work relationship they have, is very interesting. That means there is there was a consensus to achieve this, and we'll see if we can make progress now. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you. I uh, would also like to say thank you for being invited. And it's uh, a extremely distinguished, uh, a distinguished panel that I'm part of. Um, I have been given some questions uh, with regards to what it means to be working as a freelance musician here in Denmark, which is where I'm living. Um, in the Danish Musicians' Union, our members cover all aspects of freelance musical life in the entire country. 
Our members comprise of both freelance and permanently employed musicians in all genres, such as rhythmical, jazz, folk, classical orchestral musicians, singers and choirs, and a very large group of musical teachers all across the country. To be a freelance musician means that you do not necessarily have any collective bargaining agreements to protect your work rights. Some areas do, such as orchestral musicians. However, freelancers in the rhythmical area are often out on their own, so to speak, and are very dependent on contracts, agreements, remuneration, copyright laws, collective management organisations, and in particular, also being able to negotiate and speak their own value up. Um, and if I am to see the role of the trade union in this respect, we need to continue to improve the condition of our freelance musicians. We do this by creating a strong community network where they can come and discuss their needs and their challenges. We help them realise their dreams so that they, that they can actually live a life they wish to live as a musician. Uh, we help them with social security, taxes, contracts and other legal and non-legal issues in relation to their musical career. And particularly, we secure fair remuneration on all levels and continue to battle with the tech giants with regards to streaming in a very fast moving, moving and continuously changing reality. As a union, I think it's also important to be involved with our sister organisations and partners all around the world so that we are continuously in tune with what's happening in our very, at times, fragile branch so that we have the best possibility to both help our own musicians and our fellow musicians around the world. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on this category of musicians, the freelancers, it has completely removed the foundation for the work lives of many of our freelance musicians. The freelance orchestral musicians have not had the possibility of going to work for more than a year because the orchestras have been locked down and therefore there's been no need for freelancers. The freelance musicians who are either self-employed or those who find work in the field, playing at festivals, somewhere in the entertainment industry, or just as a local musician playing at parties or cafes, or all such places have been completely closed down without any work in sight and without any documentation for contracts being cancelled. And because the pandemic has been going on for so long now, there simply have not been any contracts negotiated at all. No one has dared to make any faced with the financial burden of having to reimburse. Right at this point in time, our lawyers are also deeply involved in an EU case involving the right for collective bargaining agreements uh, for freelance musicians. And I believe we're going to hear more about this from Jean-Francois, uh, so I won't speak more about this right now. But anyway, as a union here in the pandemic, it has been necessary for us to make sure that the governmental compensation covers all aspects of, of a freelance musician's life in what we refer to as a patchwork <coughs> economy, which is extremely complex. By reading legal doc, uh, the, the legal requirements in these uh, very complex uh, uh, packages and by speaking with relevant politicians and government officials. It's been a huge job for our union officials to help the musicians, to help them understand, to access and to fill the criteria needed to be able to really receive compensation from the government and to ensure that our freelance musicians are aware that there actually are, is compensation to which they are entitled. I can say though, we feel, however, as a whole, that our members have been extremely grateful and have realised the significance of being a member of a union which supports and advises them in a time of crisis. We have, unlike some unions, been able to maintain our membership levels. And I believe this is wholly due to the fact that both our politicians and employees have been extremely dedicated and worked very hard during the corona crisis while ensuring that our members have been covered, if not by governmental reimbursement packages, then by some form of the humanitarian aids where it has been possible. And I must say that communication has been a key element all the way through. Thank you.
Um, I think, I'm um, sorry, I think you're muted. Yeah, that's bad for a moderator. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Sus. Uh, I was trying to say that uh, you made a, a very interesting connection with copyright, and I don't know how much time we'll have in this conversation to to address copyright issues, but I think it's important to realize that during the pandemic, because uh, all the the live performances had disappeared, uh, it would have been fair if musicians could at least receive a remuneration when they're uh, recordings were being played online and that doesn't happen so it's clearly another challenge that we have to deal with uh, and I think you were too modest because you did you didn't mention that uh, DMF your union was hosting the first international freelance conference for musicians in 2019 two years ago uh, which was a great success yes thank you <laughs> yeah. so thank you sis. Uh so I will now leave the floor for uh, Jean-Francois well, well, hello everyone, and uh, I think you know, Sus has already uh, touched upon a bit on, on the issue that I'm going to uh, to present to you today. And uh, Benoit has already mentioned it that uh, you know we have a, a, an initiative cooking. So I'm very happy to take part in this panel about working condition of musical artists, as they are a key component of the cultural sector, as uh, Gary has mentioned, and uh, where a third of the workforce has a self-employed status. So this status has been at the heart of important competition cases relating to collective bargaining in the music industry. But uh, first, I don't know if, um, if the presentation is uh, is is to be displayed. Yes, sorry. So let, let's let's turn to the second slide then directly. So before digging into uh, you know the the conversation about music industry, I would first have a, a quick look with you at the evolution of the labor market as a whole. Lately, we have seen an increased recourse to the self-employment in the services sector due to the global process of subcontracting and outsourcing, as well as more recently to the digitalization, especially with the rise of the platform economy. These changes have brought more flexibilities and more opportunities, but have also led to worsened working conditions for some individuals, including musicians, as Sos has just mentioned. Particularly, solo self-employed may face an imbalance of power when cooperating with companies and may not be able to sufficiently influence their fees and working conditions. Collective <laughs> negotiations and bargaining can be an important tool for individuals to counterbalance the situation and improve their working conditions. However, and then here I come as, as the bad guy, um, EU as EU competition law stands today, self-employed individuals such as musicians, but also journalists or people working through platforms, risk competition law infringement if they bargain collectively. So why is that? So if we turn to the next slide. So Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union prohibits agreements on prices and other trading conditions between competing undertakings. In other words, sorry. In other words, these articles aim at sanctioning cartels. When individuals are employees, they are considered as incorporating incorporated, sorry, into the undertakings with which they have an, an employment relationship. And therefore, sorry, and therefore that, that Article 101 does not apply to them, but to their employers. So if you're an employee, you're part of a company and then commission law applies to the <coughs> company. Fair enough. On the contrary, genuine self-employed who provide their services independently on the market are considered as forming their own undertaking and thus risk infringing the cartel prohibition if they bargain collectively their fees and other trading conditions. However, when it comes to classical collective bargaining, the court has provided for an exception in its Albany ruling. So that ruling says that when undertakings as employers jointly enter into collective agreement with trade unions representing employees to improve working conditions, including salaries, these agreements fall outside of the scope of Article 101 of the treaty. The reason being that um, the treaty also has social policy objectives, which needs to be taken into account. Now, turning to the musical sector, 
a bit more, you may have heard about the FNV Kunsten or FNV King case. So in that case, a collective agreement between Dutch trade unions and the association hiring substitutes for Dutch orchestras laid down minimum fees, not only for substitutes hired as employees, but also for substitutes providing their services as self-employed. So the Dutch Competition Authority issued a reflection document stating, stating in a nutshell that self-employed substitute should also be should be sorry should be considered as undertaking and therefore could not in theory be covered by the collective agreement, despite the fact that they perform the same work as a substitute with an employee status. So the Court of um, Justice, Justice issued a preliminary ruling, meaning that they had a say about you know what was going on, and they said the the court's ruling said that when self-employed were in a situation comparable to that of employees they were in reality misclassified employees also known as false self-employed and therefore had access to collective bargaining agreements so in that case they would be considered as employees and therefore would not be within the scope of article 101 as i just described um, previously however as the law stands today, there is no express exception for genuine self-employed. Mm -hmm. That is to say, those who are not in a situation comparable to employees. They still risk infringing competition rules if they bargain collectively, um, even if they might find themselves in a weak position as compared to um, the companies buying their labor. So for instance, just if I, if I take back, if you are a true genuine self-employed working for an orchestra, and then you are not you know, in a comparable situation as, um, as an employee of that orchestra, you may still face um, um, a competitional infringement if you try to gather with all the um, as genuine self-employed who are working for um, you know, various orchestras. So this, um, Kind of issues and i will turn to the next slide has brought different approaches in the member states so for example ireland provides now for legal exceptions so that irish competition law does not apply to collective agreements of certain self-employed such as session musicians in france a solution has been found under labor law for certain sectors for instance musician who enjoyed the status of performing artist so artistes du spectacle ou intermittents du spectacle, and others presumed to be employees. That said, national competition authorities also have taken a different approach, so not only the legislators, but also the enforcers. And for instance, the Dutch competition authority now has become more cautious and opted to deprioritize enforcement against certain collective agreements of self-employed by adopting priority setting guidelines so that says like you know in certain conditions they would not apply com their national commission law whereas the danish commission authority has recently enforced the law as it stands against minimum fees between self-employed cleaners working through platforms i don't know if you've heard maybe about the happy helper and ilfa cases therefore what we can see is that there is uncertainty for self-employed as they are confronted with a var variety of approaches within the eu at national level and the thing is, of course, national commission authorities and national legislators, when they have dealt with these cases, have mainly focused on national competition law. And when it comes to defining uh, what the EU competition law should be, um, we are, of course, you know, at the forefront. So because of that, and I will turn now to the next slide, we have tried to um, launch an initiative um, and to address this situation, the Commission has launched um, this on the basis of the case law of the Court of Justice, which makes it possible to exclude agreements from the scope of Article 101 TFEU, so the cartel prohibition, if the restriction of competition is necessary and proportionate to achieve a legitimate public interest objective. <laughs> so for our initiative, what we have thought of a legitimate interest objective would be to ensure that EU competition law does not stand in the way of initiatives, which would improve working conditions through collective agreements for self-employed in a weak position. In other words, this initiative will provide a safe, a safe harbor 
so that EU competition law does not stand in the way of the social policy goal of the treaty that is ensuring improved living and working conditions. That said, and I would like to uh, prevent some, you know, people from asking too many questions already, this initiative will not address the modalities of collective bargaining, which are mostly dealt at national level, it would not address the misclassification issues, and it will not touch upon the concept of undertaking, which is at the heart of the cartel prohibition. So you may wonder how the Commission intends to define, you know, this initiative and first of all the self-employed who are in a weak position and we should benefit from it. So unfortunately we have not found objective factors that would help us to clearly identify such a group by relying on concepts such as vulnerability or precarious states. Instead we have reflected upon a set of overarching safeguards in order not to include self-employed who would not need such safe harbor. The initiative will thus only target solo self-employed who provide their own labor to or through other companies as they are most likely to be in a weaker position than self-employed with employees. And I think many um, musicians would be in that situation. In addition, it should only cover agreements with the digital platform or a professional customer, that is to say a company on the other side. It will not cover any negotiations towards consumers. So here, if I take a, the example of a music industry, if we were, I mean, if we were in a in a in a small um, in a small town where all the um, musicians playing at wedding would agree on the tariffs they uh, charge their uh, the the poor bride and and groom that are getting married, we would not allow that. But we would allow, on the contrary, that you know certain musicians, when they are solo, genuine solo self-employed, and when they bargain against you know bigger companies, platforms, they might be entitled to uh, to um, to at least you know they would not risk competition law infringement. That said, as in traditional collective agreements between employers and employees, the counterpart include should also be entitled to bargain collectively vis-a-vis -vis a group of solo self-employed or their representative. So as we have seen in the FNB Kunsten case, which is a good example at least to, to see how the you know, collective bargaining functions, you have the Dutch trade unions of musicians and you have the Dutch trade union of orchestra trying to reach an agreement and we will try to, this initiative will try to uh, be within you know, that kind of framework. So let's now turn to the next slide. I think there's a problem. I don't know if it's only me or if there's something problematic with the slides. It's, it's slide number, number seven. If it doesn't work, I will I will simply introduce it uh, quickly because it's um, it's not it's not too complicated. Um, so um, ah, here we go. So um, we are currently assessing, as I just said, which group of sole self-employed should benefit from a competition law safe harbor, and so I would introduce this option from the narrowest to the broadest. So under option one, only solo self-employed working through platforms would be covered. So it could cover musicians, but only when they provide their work through platforms. Under option two, solo self-employed provide their labor to other professional customer outside the platform economy would also be covered. So option two would um, provide you know, a bit of a limit uh, regarding the size of the company against which the solo self-employed would be allowed to bargain collectively in order to protect um, smaller, smaller, the smallest company. So basically, you know, on the one hand, you would have solo self-employed try to bargain collectively, but they would be only entitled to bargain against certain, um, I mean, to bargain with certain um, companies of a certain size, and then we would tend to exclude the smallest ones. So 
obviously we would need to uh, to set the threshold but that's the id behind it so if i take a music example this would for instance, um, be prohibiting um, musicians to uh, buy against, against small venue for concert um, if, if we were to, to reach um, you know, a very low threshold. Under option three, there would be no limitation regarding the size of the platform or the professional customer with whom the solo self-employed could bargain collectively. However, solo self-employed who are members of a regulated professions would be excluded. Well, that options uh, we understand would not uh, probably not cover many um, musicians, but um, since regulated professions have been targeted by commission authorities uh, previously, we wanted to also have that on the table. And finally, the fourth option, which is the broadest one, would cover all the solo self-employed. So all the genuine solo self-employed should be protected from uh, risking a competition law infringement. So let's now turn to the next slide for the timeline. So as um, Benoit has, has kindly mentioned, and I think um, um, SOS um, 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 organization has already replied to this, uh, we have just finished you know, an open public consultation, um, which, uh, which has gathered a lot of interest. Um, and, um, and therefore, we have also um, received contribution following the inception impact assessment. So the inception impact assessment was the first step before you know, the open public consultation. And we have also received contributions, including from Benoit's organization, FIM. And, um, and we will assess you know, what um, people have said about our initiative and how they have replied to the option. And, um, and we will also rely on a study that is going to be carried out by the a contractor, uh, which will assess a bit what the impact of um, our initiative may have on the, on the market. And the aim is to propose an action by the end of this year. And we intend to either adopt guidelines or a regulation and therefore would submit, you know, in that case, a proposal to, uh, to the council. Before, um, um, going back to, to you for questions, I would simply say that this initiative is um, is separate from another initiative of platform workers that is dealt with um, by DG employment and which concern more the substantive rights of platform workers, whereas this initiative only deals with the competition law aspect, but for self-employed in general, as long as they are genuine and solo. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Uh, that was very interesting, really. Um, I was uh, going to look at the, at the questions. We already have a couple of questions, and I see a particular one asking about freelance technicians, and I take the liberty to, to respond to that one. I think the, the question is, what about other workers in the music industry like freelance technicians or booking agents who looks after their interests? Uh, if the question is about trade unions, there are trade unions looking after the interest of these professionals. But uh, of course, Jean-Francois is uh, speaking this afternoon in a panel on, on musical artists. It doesn't mean that the, you know, the Commission's initiative is purely about musical artists. Of course not. And I think it was clear in the presentation. Uh, it's about uh, all, all, all kind of uh, self-employed workers uh, meeting the criteria that have been uh, described by Jean-Francois. Uh, coming back to this, uh, because you you listed four options uh, with, it's like the, the Russian dolls, <laughs> starting with the, the smallest uh, scope, and then the fourth option is the broadest one. But I thought, listening to you, that uh, from the moment the criteria apply, uh, I see no 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 reason to discriminate between the, the workers that would be targeted by option one which is quite narrow and option four which is the broadest uh the broadest option um I, we have we have already expressed a position on this but uh why do you think uh this this kind of we say discrimination of course I, i'm not saying this is your approach but that might be the result so why, why do you think that would be relevant to uh, to exclude some some workers from from the benefit of this initiative if I mean if uh, neutral criteria apply? 
so that should be enough so so just i, I would just um just um roll you know roll back the time so to speak so i would like to say that this initiative initially started with you know the letter of the mission letter sent to uh, our uh, executive vice president, um, Margaret Bestager. Sorry for the mispronunciation, uh, Sos. Um, but um, so it started with platform workers. So because uh, in the mission letter, um, it was clearly mentioned that working condition of platform workers should be addressed. Now, and I think you know I, I'm, I'm in the right panel to to say that. We've heard, you know, many um, sectors being affected by the same issue that the platform worker faced. That is to say, the status of self-employed and the um, prohibition um, of um, trying to bargain collectively when you are a genuine solo self-employed. So that's that's why, you know, at the beginning we started with, you know, something very narrow, which was basically mentioned in the in the mission letter. But then, you know, obviously, and I think you 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 would agree with me. This uh, issue was definitely not uh, limited to um, to um, to platform workers, and then we expanded it. Now that said, we don't want to uh, to cover um, we don't want to give a safe harbor for all the self-employed. So obviously, you have to sift through the self-employed who we should have access to collective bargaining to improve the working condition and exclude the others who do not need such um, a tool in order to improve their working conditions. And that's why, you know, every time we do a, we do a, a proposal now with the better regulation um, 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 scheme, we want to uh, we want to assess, you know, what the best option is. So that's why, you know, we put four options on the table and that goes from the narrowest to the broadest and then we assess you know which one would be the best suited and you know for each one what is the likely impact of each one so of course if we were to choose if we were to go for option one we would um you know probably make people not very happy especially in the musical industry uh, but you know we would have said that actually you know um, the poor uh, deliver riders who delivers you know uh, a meal every day is at least covered and then we would expand you know as i explained you know whether we should also include self-employed wine the offline industry and therefore you know those would be included in the option from option two to four so at the moment there is no dis discrimination as such because it's it's not even a proposal it's simply you know the option that we are thinking of in order to have the best suited regulation in order to address the issue and uh, since you know we have seen many replies especially from journalists um, but other other uh, sectors such as the media industry uh, saying that you know they would need um, collective bargaining as well to improve working con their working conditions we definitely um, going to look into this and, and see, you know, whether option two, three or four are better suited, you know, to address the issue. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Uh, I see an interesting question here. Uh, the question is, how can the same minimum wage for professional musicians be achieved in all EU countries? I think it's not, it's not the objective. And I want to recall what collective bargaining is. Collective bargaining is the tool for social partners to come to an agreement on something like a minimum wage. So actually it relies on what we call uh, social dialogue and in more concrete terms, collective bargaining. And uh, together the social partners come or do not come to an agreement on some, some issues like uh, minimum wage, but it is not the topic of the, of the commission's initiative, at least not that one. So uh, it may be that minimum wages do exist. It may be that they are the same in two neighboring countries, but uh, it is not the topic of this uh, initiative. Um, um, uh, Benoit, could I, could Gary, I add a couple of questions? Gary, please. Um, uh, there was a question in, uh, uh, earlier on about uh, senior musicians, about older musicians, and about their role. And I think that's exactly the kind of area where it's really important to understand the difference between senior artists and other seniors. Um, artists generally don't retire. Uh, artists continue to create for as long as they can create. Um, and so the fact that, you know, pension systems tend to be very rigid, you have to, you know, basically give up your prof 
profession and then you begin to collect your pension, simply don't work for senior artists. Um, and, at, and particularly don't work when it's after years and years and years of generally underpayment, right? Um, and, and so that's exactly a perfect illustration of why special measures are needed. And I must say that <laughs> to, I, I'm shocked uh, by the position of the European Commission uh, with respect to this whole issue of freelancers being able to bargain collectively. Musicians, in my view, all the musicians, all the actors, all the dancers that I know want to be seen and heard. Their objective is not to prevent or restrict access to their music, to their dance, to their performances. And so to try to examine someone like that through the same lens as some other freelance professional who has a service to sell, is just in my view, totally off base. It's completely contrary to the principles of the 1980 recommendation. And all of the member states of the European Union are, are, are you know, were, were supportive of the recommendation. And I would ask this question of you, what's the public risk of having those, all those musicians in a small town saying, well, if you want any of us to perform at your wedding, this is what it's gonna cost you. What's the public risk about that? They'll go to recorded music and pay copyright royalties. I mean, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I'm, I'm absolutely appalled that you're, you're, you're having to go down this road and you can't just acknowledge an exception for this fundamental sector. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm going to moderate a little bit here. Uh, I think I'm, I'm not going to, to support directly your, your, your view, although I fully understand, of course, as a trade unionist, but it's not the, I mean, we are relatively positive about the progress that the commission is, is engaged in. So, but so, I, I wanted to go back to uh, to the first part of your uh, intervention, Gary, about senior performers, and ask maybe Sus how this aspect is dealt with in Denmark, because the question raises two issues: uh, How can we ensure that a performer can continue to perform uh, at, at, at in the late part of their career uh, without suffering too much from health issues, uh, shoulder pain or whatever may happen. Uh, so that's one thing. And of course, uh, there is no reason to discriminate between young and, and senior performers. Uh, but the, the thing is, there is again, an interesting link with the initiative of the commission because collective bargaining is absolutely necessary to make sure that even for um, self-employed workers, they can be health and safety measures accessible. So uh, how, how would you like to comment on this? Um, I think there's uh, different issues involved in this. Uh, it depends on which, which area we're talking. But uh, actually, in, the, in Denmark, we have uh, opened a, um, a, a department at, the, at a hospital which is laying centrally in the whole country for musicians' health. Uh, which is specifically designed to 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 you know, make research in musicians' health uh, specific uh, problems with with uh, with holding instruments and and in the long run to prevent uh, physical uh, aspects of uh, physical problems with with playing an instrument in Denmark and as in Europe there's no longer a um, an age limit for they don't say you know, in the, I, I can't remember how many years ago it was that we had we had a pension age of 67 and we had to go we had to go on pension when we were 67 now there is no pension top pension age which is which is uh, great uh, but in some areas it's a problem in in, uh, in it can be an issue in orchestras for example because uh, then how does a musician uh, leave an orchestra with a uh, in a, in, a, in a good way, you know, normally there, there are some, some people find it hard to realise that maybe the time has come to go on pension. Uh, so, so that can be an issue uh, for both uh, the musicians and for the employees. 
but um, I'm not quite sure if I'm answering the question that you asked, uh, Benoit. Um, Yes, I, w I was uh, I was talking about risk prevention and the fact that as a self-employed, uh, if if you are considered a mere undertaking, you would be entirely responsible for uh, your own uh, health and risk prevention. Uh, and how can you manage that when you uh, go to a gig and you are uh, you don't have any control whatsoever on the shape of the concert hall or the the, the place where you will be performing? So. In, in my view, it is all the more necessary to provide uh, these performers with the right to negotiate because otherwise there is no way they can access any form of uh, health protection or risk prevention. And from that point of view, I, I fully subscribe to <laughs> the re reaction of Gary. Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. I, I agree completely with that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so co coming back to, to, to Gary, uh, because I hear you, of course, and as as trade unions, we we can't see any reason for uh, competition to supersede fundamental principles like the right to collective bargaining. And I think it is something that that was at the core of the of the Albany case a few years back. Uh, should we put uh, the so social objective of the European Union first, or is it competition rules that should uh, supersede? Uh, the the social objective of, of the European Union and our trade unions. I, I'm pretty sure we all uh, prefer to see the social objectives of the union uh, supersede uh, competition rules. And from uh, for, yeah, from a you, you humanitarian and from a social point of view, it makes no no debate. But what what would you say about it, uh, Jean Francois? So no no I'm 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 <laughs> I'm used to to that kind of uh, that, that kind of argumentation and 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 I'm fine because you know um, I'm coming from you know the business business world and the artists artistic side you know comes also in, into play but but not in the way you know people would want to from time to time so you know i, I would only reply you know to uh, with, with a few things so uh, so first of all you know the law applies to everyone and and so as soon as you start to have sectoral exemptions, you know, you give a sectoral exemption to some musicians, then other who want to come, and then you would go down the road and everybody would ask for it, which of course would be problematic. So I would take the example of uh, of you know the, the that I've taken before. So the you know an orchestra or I mean all the orchestra from a from a city, you know, agree, agreeing that you know they would charge, you know, a, a high fee for their performance at weddings. You know, we could compare it to uh, the fact that, you know, you didn't want in a city, uh, you wouldn't want in a city that, you know, all the performers agree to charge you uh, a certain price that is going to be very high to uh, repair your toilets. So unfortunately, I know it's completely two different uh, worlds, and it's not providing the same service at all. And 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 uh, plumbing services would not at all be compared to an artistic service. But you know, this would be the reasoning of the competition law, which is blind to you know the kind of you know artistic view that people may have. So so that's the first thing. And and second, I would also mention as uh, uh, because I don't want you know suddenly to have you know in the press that you know competition law, uh, the EU Commission wants to go after you know um orchestra playing at weddings uh, we would not deal with you know cases that are, that don't reach you know that don't affect trade between member states so we would not deal ourselves with those cases um but you know it's just to 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 give you an idea of you know where we can where we come from and then um you know of course, you know, what we want to achieve with this, I think, you know, we should see the bigger picture as well, is obviously, you know, we see that competition law, I mean, and I speak on my own behalf here, is competition law was designed for businesses, but probably initially what not designed was not designed for, you know, solo self-employed trying to do their, their little business. That said, you know, we have some rulings from the court of justice that we have to respect. And they said that when you are self-employed, you are in undertakings. And because of that, so you're undertaking because you provide your own, you know, um, services or good on the market. And therefore, you know, you can't, you know, agree on the price with your competitors. And that's where we come from. But you know, with the and that's why I mentioned in the in the um, in the presentation with the evolution of the labor market, there are more and more people being labeled as self-employed, and you know, 
the full self-employed um, um, ruling with the FNB constant, uh, sorry, this full self-employed issue with the FNB uh, ruling is a first step, you know, in order to say that, like, well, you know, if you're only, you know, self-employed by name, but you actually don't provide your services on the market yourself, you know, we're not, we're certainly not going to prevent you from, you know, having the same right as an employee. That said, you know, when you are truly an independent person that you're providing your own services on the market and you are not in a situation at all with employees, at the moment there is no answer to say that you should benefit from collective bargaining. So I know this is this is a bit uh, it's a bit harsh from competition law, but so far, you know, they could face an infringement. And for instance, when I hear, you know, that the Danish Competition Authority has has gone after, you know, um, you know, um cleaning service providers, you know, to have, you know, a minimum agreement, I mean, to have a minimum fee when they provide their services through the Happy Helper and the Hilfe platforms, you know, we obviously as the commission, we would like to do something in order to help, you know, that, you know, those cases are not uh, brought to the fore because, you know, maybe there are other, you know, cases that should have more priority um, in order to make, you know, the whole economy function. So that's why we try to, uh, to have, you know, um, you know, uh, this initiative. But at the same time, you know, we have to be careful. And I mean, I don't know about you, Gary, but for instance, you know, I've got problem with my uh, uh, plumbing here right in Brussels, and it's hard to get, you know, a plumber. And I would certainly be very uh, mad if uh, I realized that they all agree to charge me 200 euros just for coming because they have agreed with all the other plumber coming to my house that, you know, that's the price that you'd get. Thank you. Thank you. We are uh, running short of time now. So we, we should probably go to the conclusions but uh, I will ask a question, but please don't respond because <laughs> we don't have the Sorry, time. I'm, I'm being uh, my question will be, why don't you look at the definition of an undertaking? Because obviously that would be an interesting matter. But again, please don't don't respond now. I think we have to probably schedule another session. And also I see that there are questions about uh, health issues and how health is, is being dealt with. I mean, the musician's health is being dealt with in different countries. There is a question from Ian Smith, and again, that, that should probably be the, the topic of a new of a new session. Uh, we hold uh, sessions entirely dedicated to, to the health of musicians uh, with FIM. We do it about every two years. Uh, it's very important, and that's a, a significant part of what we call working conditions. How can you uh, remain a musician uh, late in your career? and continue to be able to perform if your health is deteriorating. So may I ask you, each of you, to propose a, a short conclusion of 20 seconds, uh, starting with Gary. So then I will ask Zeus and the final words to Jean-Francois. Gary. Um, it, it, these issues are all really fundamental, and we have to continue to work on them because artists are different. Uh, let me just uh, quickly on the health thing. Uh, we have in Toronto an artist health center. And what makes it different? Well, there's a sound studio along with it because the challenge for the musician might be their technique. It may have nothing to do with other factors, right? It might be their technique. There's a sprung floor because the challenge with the injury to the dancer may be because of their technique. So you need a whole different approach. And I think that highlights why the 1980 recommendation continues to be so important and why we have to find a way to build on it because artists do work in different ways and yet they're so fundamental to all of our societies. Thanks, Gary. So, and I would like to and just reinforce what I was talking about, that the, the, the life of a freelance musician really needs to come into focus also politically uh, because it's, it's, a, it's very complex. It's a patchwork uh, economy and it, it's a gig economy, as we all say, and, and, and there's more of it, it's becoming more prevalent in, in our society in general. So um, that's something we would like very much to place focus on. And I think it's very necessary on all levels. Thank you. Thank you, Sirs. Jean-Francois. So in, in a nutshell, I would first um, like to thank, you know, all the, the people who have replied to the open public consultation that we have launched um, because we have seen, you know, a high interest in the in the in the music sector, but also in in the media industry in general. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank um, thank you for that. And I would say that um, we, we are not against musicians. We are not against anyone. 
we are trying to here to help and uh, and at least you know to um, to settle an issue that has been you know plaguing you know the the relationship between musicians and um, to whom they provide their services not to consumer but you know studios or uh, or platforms and so on and so forth in order to give them at least the comfort that they would not infringe competition law when they try to um, group together in order to gain more bargaining power. Thank you. Well, that was a, that was a great panel. I learned a lot from all of you. Uh, I'm just sorry we cannot uh, make it last uh, much longer. Uh, for all those who are attending now, there is uh, don't leave the forum. You don't have to leave the forum now. You can go to the next event. There is a launch uh, open, a launch network uh, open. Uh, where you, you are, you can exchange about your experiences on the topic we just addressed, on other or other topics we attempted to address very quickly. Um, I want yes. I was Sorry, I would I, I would just add something quickly. Um, if you're interested in the commission initiative, you know I have put a link in my bio um, that was provided, you know, for this forum. So if you're interested in to to know what more about it, you know, you can definitely click on that link and, and see, you know, what uh, what is going on and, and what will come up ultimately. Okay, and thank you, thank you, Jean-François. Uh, I'm sure many many of us, many of the attendees will have a look at this. It is very important. We see it as a great initiative uh, with with a great potential. We will do everything we can to make it deliver at the level we we want, <laughs> if possible. Uh, just if if I can say a few words of conclusions, uh, conclusion. I think this kind of uh, gathering, where uh, people from the music sector can exchange and uh, try to understand better how the music sector works. Uh, what happened during the pandemic, how we can uh, take initiative to avoid the same uh, catastrophe uh, and, and, and we don't see again musicians on their knees, uh, living with nothing, uh, receiving no income at all. We, we need to get together and promote uh, a better, better standards for professional musicians. And the topic that we did not address at all is the copyright and related right issue. Uh, of course, you will remember that uh, a new directive was adopted in 2019 and the way it is going to be transposed in member states is crucial. If we want streaming to deliver for performers, something has to change and the status quo is not, a, not an option, should not be an option. So whatever you can do to support the musicians trade unions in your country or to make sure that the that this new directive is transposed in a favorable way for performers, please do it. And if you don't know how to do it, you can always contact the AMC, contact your trade union, or contact FIM. Thank you to everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.